Good evening, and welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. I'm Bob Delaney, Executive Director of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. Labor Vision, a production of the Institute, focuses on topics of importance and interest to working Rhode Islanders. We hope you enjoy this evening's edition. Good evening and welcome to Labor Vision. I'll be your host tonight. My name is George Nee. I'm the president of the Rhode Island AFL-CIO and we have a very knowledgeable and distinguished panel here tonight to discuss the issue of apprenticeship and its importance to the Rhode Island economy, uh, its history and what's going on today, what are the issues facing it. Uh, so I'd like to start by uh, asking each of the uh, panelists if they would introduce themselves and uh, give people what their title is, etc. Start with you, Mike. Good evening. Uh, my name is Michael Sabatoni. I am the business manager of Construction and General Laborers Local Union 271, and I am also the president of the Rhode Island Building and Construction Trades Council, uh, representing uh, about 10,000 construction tradesmen and women uh, in and around the state of Rhode Island. Hello, George. Um, Greg Mancini, I am with uh, Build Rhode Island, and Build Rhode Island is a uh, combination or a coalition of uh, the 17 construction trade unions and three different contractor associations um, who employ uh, the men that Mike and the women that Mike talks about, and I'm their executive director. Good evening, George. Thank you for having me here. My name is Bill Holmes. I'm the business manager for the Carpenters Union in Rhode Island as well as the chairman of the Rhode Island State Apprenticeship Council. Okay. George, pleasure to join you. My name is Andrew Cortez. I'm the director of Building Futures, which is a local pre-apprenticeship <laughs> initiative. And I also have the honor of serving for Secretary Solis on the National Apprenticeship Advisory Council. Okay, terrific. Mike, let's start with you. Okay. Let's, let's take it from the very beginning. What is apprenticeship and why is it important to the men and women that you represent? Apprenticeship in the construction industry uh, I believe has had a, a long history, well over a, a hundred years, back into probably the, uh, the 18th century uh, in, in the construction industry. And apprenticeship is basically a uh, time-tested mechanism uh, for us in the construction industry to bring young men and women uh, into uh, various trades and allow them the opportunity to learn under the guidance of uh, journey persons who are proficient in a particular a craft or trade uh, on the job as well as uh, partake in any additional training that might be necessary and um, an awareness of the task that, that that's being performed and it's gotten into a very technical state as we've progressed through the 19th uh, century into the 20th century now into the 21st century of uh, how technical the construction business has become the apprenticeship and training programs have done the same to keep up with the times and uh, we feel that uh, that is the way for us to continue to replenish uh, people uh, in the trades as well as afford our employers uh, the skilled trades men and women they need to provide quality construction projects to, to construction end users. And uh, that's the model that we've followed for, uh, for well over 100 years and uh, that will continue to follow. And we believe that sets us apart uh, and br really brings quality craftsmanship uh, to the industry. Oh, Greg, you uh, mentioned that Build Rhode Island is a coalition of both employers uh, and the men and women in the construction trades. Uh, why is it important to employers? What's, what's the value to an employer to participate in a, an apprenticeship program? Well, all of our contractors actually choose to be union, and construction is the only industry where the contractor can make an affirmative decision to be union. And so they do that because uh, the unions provide them with the skilled labor or give, actually give them immediate access to the skilled labor that they need to complete jobs safely, timely, uh, and obviously within budget. So those are the reasons. Okay. Now, Bill, you said you're the uh, chairman, in addition with the Carpenters Union, which we'll get to in yes. a second, but what is the State Apprenticeship Council? Uh, who's on it? Who appoints it? And how does it fit into this whole situation? And Give us some examples, if you could, of what would be apprenticeable trades. Um, the State Apprenticeship Council is comprised by uh, statute, which fo uh, follows the federal guidelines 
um, the federal guidelines on apprenticeship is passed down to the states. The states have options in which they adopt certain regulations. Um, it's made up of four employee representatives and four employer representatives. Um, it's not a union, non-union issue, it's employee, employer. Our mission is to watch out for all of apprentices in the state of Rhode Island in the various crafts. The construction industry is the main user of apprenticeship, but lately we've been developing more apprenticeships in the nursing industry, in the uh, veterinary um, industry, and it's expanding every day. Uh, more and more industries are seeing the need to train younger people and get them into the trade. Our organizations are all getting older, especially in the construction trade, uh, and we see the need to replenish. So the council's uh, role in that is to make sure that the apprentices are not being misused or mishandled in their day-to-day -day, uh, activities in whatever field they choose. Now, are, are there some minimum standards? I mean, can uh, some industry or some employer just uh, come to you and say, uh, gee, it sounds good, I, I want to be in an apprenticeable trade. Do you have some minimum standards? Do you investigate them so that we don't have sort of any fraud out there where people are claiming to have apprentice apprentices and it's really a phony program? Oh, we run across that a lot. Um, unfortunately, there are employers out there that uh, are unscrupulous and like to use the and I don't even want to say the young people because we're getting apprentices now in their 30s and 40s that have uh, come into various industries. And so the council has, uh, through the state, right now unfortunately there's only one representative that goes out and checks the programs to make sure they're not, uh, that they are following their guidelines set forward by the council, as well as uh, making sure they're attending their related training. Because not only do they have to have on the job training, which is important, they also have to have, in most trades, at least 144 hours of related training, classroom type, type training. Okay. George, if I could yeah, just sure. add, and Mike. I think, um, echoing what Billy is saying, that you see other industries that haven't traditionally been uh, apprenticeship uh, trades or, or industries, you see them moving to a, a time-tested model of on-the-job experience in learning uh, uh, simultaneously with classroom experience in learning. And I, and I think uh, because of that and the time-tested success that we've had in the construct construction industry, you see other industries looking at that model and saying that this might, might be a good fit for our own industry. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's why you see, as Billy is saying, other industries looking at that model and saying, we think this would be a good fit for us also, because it combines the on-the-job, at-work experience of learning on the job, as well as the simultaneous uh, classroom experience and learning uh, at the same time. Okay, <laughs> Andrew, Building Futures, uh, yep. give us a little idea of, of really what that is and how does that fit into this whole apprenticeship uh, sure. conversation? Yeah, no, it's uh, Building Futures is an initiative which really looks at how do we connect to the communities who are disenfranchised currently, bring them into the economy through this time-tested model of registered apprenticeship. Um, and what we do is a very comprehensive program to prepare young urban adults. Our average age is about the same average age as nationally uh, for apprentices, which is about 27. Uh, and it's very interesting in terms of we're able to effectively connect and fill some of the gaps that apprenticeship programs aren't set up to cover. Apprenticeship is a wonderful system to develop technical skills related to a craft or an occupation, but they're not social service agencies. So by combining, uh, and by really developing a comprehensive pre-apprenticeship program, we're able to fill some of the gaps that happen to exist between community residents who want to enter and access this system and the actual system itself. Because, you know, as our panelists have all mentioned, apprenticeship cannot afford to be the best kept workforce development secret anymore. Uh, the system has been around for hundreds of years. It actually dates back informally over 4,000 years, regulated first in Wisconsin actually in 1911 by the federal government in 1937. Little known fact is that the registered apprenticeship system has trained more people, provided more occupations than the entire WIA public workforce system combined. So it's a really important system, and basically our community-based organization is leveraging this incredible infrastructure for the benefit of community residents. So you're really a bridge between the community organizations that have 
people who are looking for a good career path, uh, good solid wages, benefits, et cetera, to the apprenticeable trades. That's so, one way to look at it. Often, so, so how often, does someone find out about you? How do, you don't want to be mm -hmm. a secret, right? Mm -hmm. uh, quite honestly, we can't be a secret because our graduates spread it word of mouth. Okay, the great. success of one community residence spreads throughout the community. We honestly don't do any targeted recruitment except for women. We are trying to encourage more and more women to look at construction career paths in the apprenticeship model. Uh, but you know, the recruitment issue is really a non-issue because our folks are successful. We have a 96% retention rate of those we have placed. They go back to their communities. They show their success. Other residents come to us. Very good. Mike, um, sounds great. How's it funded? How, you know, what, what's the model? How, do, how does this happen? Because it's, you know, I think as Andrew mentioned, it's, it's a, it's a time-tested uh, procedure doing more, and it is, a, it is unfortunately more of a secret than mm -hmm. it should be, so. I'll, I'll let Andrew speak on the funding mm -hmm. of the Building Futures program yeah. itself, but as far as the apprenticeship and training <clears throat> programs that are, uh, that are in place with the various trades, uh, they're funded by employer uh, contributions uh, in collective bargaining agreements that they're in uh, employer and union, um, uh, so they're, they're boards of trustees that oversee the training curriculum that develop uh, the different uh, training aspects of the, of the various crafts. And, uh, and as Greg had mentioned, these are the, this is the reason why employers choose to be union employers because of the pool and the training of a whole industry and a whole workforce as opposed to an individual apprenticeship training program or an individual company training, uh, training program where you actually train the whole industry in, in various classifications of laborers, carpenters, uh, plumbers and pipe fitters. So they're, they're joint jointly administered training programs of equal number of employer and union representatives for the betterment of the industry uh, as a whole. I'd just like to also comment on the, on the importance of the program that Andrew was doing, and he touched on a very important point, that, that for all the good things that the unions have done over their history and training and apprenticeship and representing their membership, the one thing that we always had difficulties with was uh, um, understanding the obstacles and the impediments of of certain uh, uh, individuals, especially from the urban centers uh, of their uh, life issues that, that come in. And, uh, and that's why that program is so successful and that's why I think you heard that number of uh, a 94 or 96% retention rate. Uh, prior to this program of Building Futures, our retention rate was somewhere in the middle 60s because of all the good things that we did paying attention to the social aspect and the, and the life issues of an individual uh, were something that, uh, that we didn't uh, have the, uh, the mechanisms or the know-how of how to get our arms around that. And uh, that's why I believe that that program is so successful. And that's why the building trades as a whole, uh, when, that, when this idea had come about about seven years ago, said this is something we're interested in to get us back to our urban core, to diversify uh, our membership in, in the trades. And as Billy had mentioned, you know, it's, uh, you know, when we look at the average age of membership across the trades as a whole, uh, we're in somewhere in the low 50s. And uh, we will see a shortage, even though in the economic circumstances we find ourselves in today, uh, all of the uh, studies and analysis that we've done uh, for the next uh, 10 or 12 years, there will be a shortage of skilled tradesmen and women uh, in the industry across the country. And this is our effort to make sure that we are, we're able to meet that uh, before it happens. Well, let me just mm -hmm. jump back to you sure. for a second, Andrew, because uh, obviously there's a commitment as expressed mm -hmm. by Mike from, from the building trades unions to this concept mm -hmm. to essentially locate and identify and then train the workforce for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Do you have com similar types of commitments from employers in Rhode Island that understand the value of this both in terms of helping people get these jobs and also what it means to the overall economy. Yeah, from a Building Futures perspective, we really have multiple clients. If we're not providing a good qualified entrant to a, an employer, then we're not doing our job. So we have to make that value proposition very clear. So yes, we have relationships with all of the contractors who are signatory to the variety of apprenticeship programs. And if you don't mind, just, just in case viewers at home aren't familiar with the apprenticeship model, just to back up a minute, uh, the Department of Labor actually recognizes over 1,000 career areas as apprentices. The minimum standards for apprenticeship is an occupation that requires 2,000 hours of hands-on training to provide 
uh, competencies, and it has to be combined with a minimum of 144 hours of related technical instruction. So it's a combination of experiential learning on the job site plus related technical instruction at a minimum. And now with the revised regulations that Chairman Holmes was mentioning, uh, there are actually three different options in how you can structure an apprenticeship program. <coughs> so it's becoming more adaptable and more flexible every single day because it's a really smart investment. Because what happens is the public expenditure is very minimal because you're leveraging the investment of the private sector employers who choose to be union, precisely because they recognize they can get that skilled workforce they need from these registered apprenticeship programs. And, and to get back to sure. your initial question, uh, these are private uh, employer mm -hmm. contributions into multi-employer trust funds that pay for the apprenticeship and training for the, for the industry. So if I follow this, the different union, laborers or carpenters or plumbers, would negotiate with their contractors mm -hmm. and allocate a certain amount of money to the training apprenticeship program. program. Mm -hmm. the training tra the tra training, tra and apprenticeship, training programs. apprenticeship program. Mm -hmm. And then there would be a board established to develop the curriculum for that and the standards for that and That's correct. hours and everything. So it's, it's, really, it, it's really a joint labor management cooperative effort. It is. And that, does the amount vary from That's trade it. to trade or craft to craft mm -hmm. in terms of the employer contribution? Yes, it does. It, it all depends on the, uh, you know, the specific needs. The, the, uh, we have different uh, curriculums, different lengths of, uh, of apprenticeship. So depending on the needs of the training trust fund, you could have various contributions contained in the collective uh, bargaining agreements. But uh, the genius of it, I think, is that it's, it's each union <coughs> has a different amount that they negotiate in terms of training. Right. They're going to make contributions. Give us, give me an example. But it's, I, but it's measured by. I'd be, but it, I'm sorry. Uh, Go ahead, Bill. I'd be happy. To. Yeah, just give I, me an I, example. I'd be, on what, behalf what of the Cochrane Union. So, yeah. Let me step back in my other hat. Yeah, right. Get your other hat. Um, we have negotiated, the Carpenters Union has negotiated a 30 cents per okay. hour. Okay, that's making it Based more. on all carpenters that are working out, all union carpenters that are working out there. Okay. 30 cents per hour goes into our apprenticeship fund. Okay. Last year, we expended almost $300,000 on behalf of 150 apprentices that we right. have. So that money would go to pay for the instructors, the instructors, the materials, the, materials, exactly. the supplies, the rent or whatever. For the, you have, and most of these unions have a, a facility or a training place where, the, where this goes on. Exactly. Well, class facilities. But, the, but the thing yeah. I want to point out is that it's, it's, not the, it's not coming off the back of the apprentices. It's actually the journey person and the apprentice, all the workers are actually Oh, right, yeah, because essentially you could make an argument that if you didn't have an apprenticeship system that either the employer would be keeping the 30 cents in your case or the employee, the worker, would That's have correct. 30 cents more. So this is an understanding of an investment in the future to keep an industry going and to have a well-trained, educated workforce. Mm -hmm. To really operate a training and apprenticeship program, this is the, the, there would be no single employer that could really afford to do it the way that it is done to actually meet yeah. the needs of the industry, which is why, as Greg had mentioned and Andrew had mentioned, companies choose to become uh, union and signatory contractors because of that investment and because of the investment into the pool as a whole to train the workforce as a whole as laborers and carpenters and plumbers and pipefitters. I also like to mention that this isn't just about apprenticeship also. Contained in those, that's why they're called training and apprenticeship okay, programs. Good point. The journey person mm -hmm. upgrades, upgrades to keep mm -hmm. up with the various mm -hmm. changing times and Technology. different regulations like, that so, come so down. So it's, like, like, and so it's an introductory education and a continuing education. And it's education. a lifelong okay. learning uh, fund right. for, so for let, journey let's, person. Let's break this down to the simplest component. Carpenters Union, um, I want to be an apprentice. What am, what am I looking for? Do you have an interview process? Do you have to figure out how many new people you take in every year? Uh, is, a, is it an open process? to? Uh, is it publicized, et cetera, so that I can go there? And then how long is it? You know, okay. what, what kind of, yeah, just, just give, so, so uh, someone sitting out there that. says, I want to be in a, I want to be a carpenter. How do, how do I become a, a real carpenter? A <laughs> Thank you. Carpenter. Thank you. Um, typically, and these are not typical times that we're in. Yeah. Unfortunately, the economy has been uh, not, not great um, by any stretch. Uh, we're, we're getting through it. Uh, typically, the Carpenters Union takes applications year round. 
we evaluate uh, during the year on how many apprentices we think we're going to need based on the amount of uh, work opportunities that are out there. We also look at how many are graduating and we, we try to keep that cycle going every year. Unfortunately, the last couple of years we haven't taken that many in. We advertise, uh, it's posted on all the unemployment centers, it's posted on all the uh, the WEIR boards. Mm -hmm. uh, we have um, notification processes to all of the minority communities, the women communities, the women organizations. So they know we're open for business when we are. Unfortunately, we're not right now. We hope to be very soon. Mm -hmm. um, it's a four-year apprenticeship. Okay. Uh, most of the trades are four years, not all. Some are five and a few are three in the construction industry. Uh, Andrew's organization has been a great help. Uh, we kind of label his uh, Building Futures and Youth Build as a pre-apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. um, Andrew teaches them all of the things about having to get up on time, how, how to, that they're going to have to work out in the weather mm -hmm. all on most of the time. And uh, these, these kids that come out of college or come out of high school are not really aware of that. And Andrew's organization does a great job of preparing them before they get to us because what we found over the years prior to uh, Youth Build and Building Futures was the kids or the young adults or even the older adults that came into the union uh, in the first year they finally said I got to get up I've got to travel I've got to work out in all this cold weather in the rain mm -hmm. we work that way yeah. that's that's what our organization does uh, it's a culture shock to a lot of these kids that have worked at McDonald's or wherever they've worked along the way so that's where apprenticeship goes. As, as we've said before, you're uh, supposed to work uh, up to 2,000 hours a year in the field on the job training, at OJT, on the job training, as well as the related training, like in the carpenter field. We have so many varied fields from forms, wood framing, pile driving, floor laying, drywall, ceilings. There's a lot of opportunities in our business and trying to get a, a younger adult uh, familiar with all of them, that's where they go to the related training and get exposed to all the different aspects of each individual trade. Then they'll decide what they like the best and they'll kind of gravitate towards that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Mike, labor out there working their 40 hours if they're lucky these days, mm -hmm. when do they go to school? Uh, nights, weekends? Uh, the, the different trades have different uh, setups on how they uh, they, how they conduct do the, their curriculum. The classroom training some, part of it. some do it at night, some do it on Saturdays. Uh, the laborers do it that we do what we call a Gen Con one two. Uh, then we we give them a schedule after after so many months of on the job, they come back and they need to take you know uh, upgrades of uh, of general construction. And then the last year, we allow them what we call uh, an elective, so that as Billy had mentioned, the construction industry has gotten very specialized where we do a wide, a wide array of things also as the laborers union. We do heavy and highway, we do asphalt, we do concrete, we do demolition, asbestos, hazardous waste remediation, mason tending, carpenter tending. So someone uh, who's going to get a background in each one of those aspects. But that's why we start them off in a general construction, give them give them a flavor of everything that a laborer okay. does, but yep. usually by the third or fourth year he might hone in on, on something that he likes to do uh, and, uh, and, and, and get earmarked particularly for that and take classes more relevant to that towards the third and fourth year of his apprenticeship. But we also encourage all of the of our individuals in the lifelong learning in the trades to learn how to do everything because you know you have times where you know you have to go where the work is where we see, uh, coincidentally now, we saw the pendulum swing from a lot of vertical or building construction over the last three to five years, swinging back towards the heavy and civil construction. So, you know, if you want to have a career in the construction industry, you need to be multiversed in, in what you know how to do. But our industry has become specialized with specialty subcontractors, but uh, you still need to be flexible in order to make a career in this industry. It's a very difficult industry, but it also is a very rewarding industry. From the management point of view, uh, are things working out still well? Well, <clears throat> yes, I mean. Um... And, and are the union contractors, are they at a somewhat of an, a disadvantage with some of the other contractors that don't participate in an apprenticeship program, don't put that extra money in? Uh, you know, it's, it, it seems like uh, you, you folks are doing 
the responsible thing for the community and you got other people who might just be taking advantage and riding on uh, uh, the, the programs that you've established. Uh, playing on a level playing field in construction can be very, very difficult. There are some apprenticeship programs that we don't have confidence in that what they do is they hire apprentices and they go through them and don't graduate them to become journey persons. Uh, and they do that because they can pay them a low a wage. Um, the other thing is construction is an extremely competitive business and that's good. The bad part about it is not only apprentice uh, people make shortcuts, but on wage and hour laws they make shortcuts to undercut the competition and win bids. So it's a huge problem. It's a huge problem on a variety of issues uh, that extend, in, that include apprenticeship, but extend also to wage and hour and misclassification of employees uh, that is uh, hurting the law-abiding uh, business person that wants to play by the rules. So yes, it is, it's a challenge for us to deal with. But we have yeah. taken, George, we have taken a step in the right direction as a state. Uh, I believe it was in 2007, uh, the state of Rhode Island passed a, a law that any uh, public works project or prevailing rate project in the state of Rhode Island, in the state of Rhode Island uh, with a, a dollar amount uh, of $1 million and over will have uh, apprenticeship uh, mandates on them to, for the classifications needed to perform uh, the, the project. And uh, the state recognized as the largest user of construction services, the largest client, yep. uh, that uh, as we had mentioned with some of the studies and some of the shortages that we see, the need to make sure that, uh, that the pipeline will continue to be there and that will continue to bring people into the industry and create the need and the awareness and the necessity to have apprenticeship uh, to develop the workforce of tomorrow. So I commend you know, the legislature for see having that foresight and passing that law in 2007, which, uh, which will uh, make sure that there's opportunities. And that has helped a little bit, yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that that's uh, the point that Andrew made earlier, that you know we have to start looking at this apprenticeship model as possibly the best model for workforce development, if we're talking about that in the state seriously, this model has worked. There and, is, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it should be the public policy of the state. If you have employers and unions that are willing to invest in the future, essentially, they should not be penalized. In fact, they should get an incentive Credit. for That's doing right. that, never mind just not being penalized. And in this but, day and age, but, it, just as you get into Andrew, yeah. it, with budget crisis and deficits, the state isn't paying for the training. Correct. It's the, right. it's the private sector that's, play, that's paying for the, the development and, and of the workforce. And, there's, and I think the value is that they're setting the curriculum. So I guess at the end of the program, the employer has confidence that if that person gets a right. certificate and graduates mm -hmm. from the apprenticeship program, they, they know that that person is qualified, ready to go do the work necessary because they've set the standards. That's cool. it's, it's a really important point and it's not possibly the best system. It is the best system. I mean, I will stand by it. Right. I'm a product of it myself. I think if we took a vote right now, we'd probably... Uh, <laughs> I, I think so. I think so. I think we have the votes. Um, but, you know, re registered apprenticeship, and I keep coming back to the word registered okay. because often people use the term apprenticeship lightly. Um, confuse it with internships, a uh, variety of things like that. When we say registered apprenticeship, we're talking about the formal structure of these apprenticeship programs. And they can be uh, sponsored by a single employer as well as a pool of employers with a labor union. Obviously, this model makes a lot of sense economically speaking because an employer isn't competing. Like, you know, you have that dynamic sometimes where if a single employer had a program and they trained up the best worker, what happens if somebody else wants to steal them, right? So right. this model actually takes care of that and makes economic sense. Uh, so it's a really, really important and valuable system which we have to expand because it's private sector investment. On a national level, you're leveraging $2 billion for an $85 public expenditure per apprentice. It wow. just makes smart economic yeah. sense. Now you just raised an interesting question. Uh, is, is this uh, a trade, or once you get this apprenticeship certi uh, certification, good all across the country? Yes, yes, absolutely. All of the trades have expanded. That's, that's with, probably different than a lot of with, other types of programs. With the mobility of manpower, as, as you will, and the transient right. nature of people these days, they go where the work is. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, this country right now, there's not a lot of work very well, uh, almost anywhere. But I know with all of the 
the trades. They can take their apprenticeship certificate from here to California, to Alaska, to Hawaii, and, it, yeah. and it's, it's accepted. System. It's a fed, yeah. It's governed by the federal, okay. passed down to the state. The state has councils like my, Oz right. that oversee the, make sure all of the individual programs are running right, and so that those certificates have value. Mm -hmm. Well, I think in a small state that makes sense because I'm sure that uh, many times people go to work at least throughout the New England area, mm -hmm. you know, and so you wouldn't want to have that as a barrier and have to go Absolutely get an apprenticeship not. in each. Maybe the bar association should learn from that, but I guess too much money in the bar association. <laughs> <laughs> Taking the test. And George, in addition to the, the reciprocation amongst the states, you also have uh, accreditation agreements mm -hmm. that we have with junior colleges. We have one with CCRI where they give uh, That's a good so point. many Let's credits that towards mm -hmm. the completion of apprenticeship program for a continuing education. So should a young man or woman de decide to do that? So by taking the classroom work, the, the classroom component of it, in addition to meeting the requirements for the apprenticeable trade, the person is also potentially earning classes and heading towards a, uh, a college degree. That's correct. Correct. Well, that's that's because, because of the programs and the way that they were developed with the curriculum mm -hmm. and with the on-the-job training, a successful completion of our apprenticeship programs uh, give them a jump start to a, an associate's degree and then maybe even a, a bachelor's degree. And I think it's uh, the average is somewhere around 20 credits towards mm -hmm. uh, an associate's uh, degree from the Community College of Rhode Island upon a successful completion of an accredited program mm -hmm. like Andrew was saying. Mm -hmm. Uh, towards that uh, degree. Now, I remember a couple of years ago, there was a hot item called apprenticeship ratios, mm. if I remember correctly, and you were right in the middle of that. Unfortunately. Because I, I would imagine that that becomes a pretty uh, important part of an apprenticeship program because you want to, on the, on the job training, it's important, I would imagine, for the person not to just be sent out there and said, okay, yeah, you know, sort of a wink and a nod, go and do your job. You've got to be learning, I mean, from people who have been doing this for a long time. So how does that ratio system work? And who, how is it established? How is it enforced? Unfortunately, it wasn't enforced as well as it should be. Uh, and that was one of the problems. Um, ratios were developed to protect the apprentice and to still make it profitable for an employer to use it. Uh, you just mentioned the, the possibility. You don't want to send a first, second, you don't want to send any apprentice out there without a journeyman at least close by mm -hmm. to oversee, but especially in their early terms of apprenticeship. And that's what we were finding out there. There were, as I mentioned before, there are some unscrupulous contractors out there that all they're interested in is the bottom line. Yes, you do get an advantage for, employ, for employing apprentices, but you want to make sure that they're trained properly, and that they work safely. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's key in this. You want to come home with all of your appendages well, at the end know, of the day. And I, and I think there's a... And so you want to make sure that there's a, the right amount, and that's where the ratio came in. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it varies from trade to trade, but the accepted practice is more like one to four or one to five. Mm -hmm. Most of the trades work at those kind of ratios so that you have four journeymen and one apprentice, or five journeymen and one apprentice, at least working in the, in the same area, so that that apprentice is trained by all of those four people or five people, and they're working safely. There's also an important aspect of proper ratios, which have been around as long as the programs themselves, and the move afoot a few years ago was to uh, eliminate those ratios from or well, most programs or all programs start with one to one for the first apprenticeship and then a ratio thereafter of either one to three, one to four, one to five. So as you steadily increase your crew, you can bring on another apprentice. And it's got, there's two important reasons why that type of model of as you steadily increase your crew with journey persons, you bring on another apprentice uh, was the model that worked for, for decades. And the reason was twofold. One, the quality of craftsmanship so that you made sure you had a proficient amount of journey persons on the job so that you had the quality of construction that uh, journey persons that were proficient in their craft to know what they were doing because they're apprenticeable craft and some of them are licensed crafts. And the second reason is this. We use the word on-the-job training. When you're an apprentice, you are on the job in a learning experience, uh, in a real life experience, so that you will learn while you're on the job, while you also take the, the required classroom t uh, training simultaneously. I think the, the move to bring one-to-one 
would eliminate that opportunity to learn without the pressures of production on a job site. It just makes no sense. If half your workforce uh, was uh, not proficient in the craft, and in addition, half that workforce was being required to also produce at a journey person level, where is the on-the-job training aspect? Where is the, where is the, the, the non-pressure so that you can learn as you go uh, without the pressures of produ production? And that's why employers over decades had decided, you know, for the first one, which is probably on a small scenario if you have a two-man job, one-to-one -one works. But as you increase yeah. the crew sizes, the complexity of the job, the scope of the project, you need so many journey persons and then another apprentice so that this true model, this true learning experience that's been tied and tested, as Andrew had said, for, for, for thousands of years, in our instances, hundreds of years in the building trades uh, in, the, in this country has worked. And that's why- well, The other thing is that the market can't absorb one-to-one -one ratios. That's another reason. The key piece yeah, no to this whole thing, it's been developed over years at a joint um, effort between owners of companies and the unions, they developed what was the proper ratio. Mm -hmm. Over years of experience, they, they determined, and it has worked. Mm -hmm. It's worked for all these years that an effort to change this in this day and age is nothing more than economics. Mm -hmm. So in the, uh, in the apprenticeship system, how much emphasis is there on safety? And, and how does that you know, uh, relate to the difference as time goes on between the unionized construction field and the non-union field? I just think safety in the construction industry isn't relevant to just apprenticeship. Uh, it's uh, relevant with everything that we do. Uh, the employers that we, uh, uh, that we have uh, agreements with spend, uh, in addition to the training funds, they all have health and safety funds and safety offices. And we spend a lot of time jointly as, uh, as labor and management developing uh, orientation plans, site safety orientation plans, and trying to bring uh, safety across the board working with industry partnerships with OSHA on particular jobs. For instance, the TF Green into Modal project was an OSHA uh, uh, employer union industry a partnership agreement that the employer would do this, OSHA would do this, the trades would do this. So our emphasis on uh, on safety uh, even expands beyond uh, apprenticeship. But the safety issue also uh, gets back to the ratio issue and having you know enough journey persons. Uh, on a job so that the quality of construction is there and the journey person is able, uh, the apprentice is able to learn from, uh, from different journey people how to, how to perform in his craft. But safety in our industry goes, goes well, that, far beyond apprenticeship. And that's, that's got to be a, a very competitive advantage to the employer. And it's a yeah, huge I mean, that, that's, advantage. And it's a huge human advantage. One accident, one injury can probably blow a whole job off. Our guys are proud of the fact that, I, I, I don't know the exact numbers, but I know that Last 10 years, or last maybe 15 years, OSHA has c documented about 23 fatalities in Rhode Island from, in the construction industry alone, yep. and only one of them came from our guys, and that's despite the fact that most of our guys have built most of the major projects in Rhode Island. That's right. you know, the whole skyline of Providence was built by our contractors. Sure. You know, on Green Airport, the improvements in Green, Amgen, major expansion down there, built by our contractors. Only one fatality is impressive mm -hmm. that we're proud of. Well, well it's time, George, time to wrap up, no. so last, no, let's get last comment from Andrew and one from Billy, and then we're... Well, I better make it a good comment. Yeah, better make it a good comment. Um, so one thing is apprenticeship programs, registered formal apprenticeship programs, are not train and pray programs. They're business-driven solutions to economic needs. And it really represents the concept of a career lattice is not new to apprenticeship. Because as Michael was mentioning, it is articulate there is a wage progression and a learning progression because people are earning while they're learning. It's reverse college. So pre-apprenticeship community residents can enter with advanced standing because there is an articulation between us and the various registered apprenticeship programs. Similarly, lifelong learning opportunities for apprentices and journey level workers with articulation agreements throughout. You can actually earn a master's degrees with credit through the National Labor College by accessing mm -hmm. your credits as an apprentice or a journey level worker. So registered apprenticeship should not be the best kept secret, something to be expanded, business driven solution, and let's once all again, make it work. It is the best. The best. No <laughs> question. Part of a workforce development system. No question. Billy, as the head of the apprenticeship council, last comment. What I'd like to say is construction apprenticeship is leading to a good career, a well 
paying career. Unfortunately, uh, we've all gotten into this mindset that all of our kids have to go to college. The construction industry is a very viable solution and you don't have to pay to go to college. We pay for it. Thank you. Sounds great. Well, thank you all for your you, uh, time tonight. Thank and I thank hope you. that the viewers uh, learned something. And thank you again for your service to making this a better state. Thank you, Tom. Thank, thank you, George. Okay. I've been involved with this program from day one, and I'm here to talk to you about the reality of going out into the construction world. Because I know, because I hire, and I deal with people like you. So I want to tell you the truth, the facts. I know you've gone through some good training here. This is a great program. We firmly believe in it. It's successful. It can continue to be successful. But I have to emphasize, most importantly, and you've got to really think about this, we're in the beginning stages here. And each time there's a graduation class, it counts, it matters to keep this thing going. What you do is going to reflect on this program. When you make it into the trades, how you perform, what occurs out there reflects on this program. So it's more than just your own livelihood you have to think about. And I know that's important, that's essential. You're all here to get careers. But I want you to think about building futures too. Because you're going to represent out in that field, building futures. And right now, we need the best representation we can get. It's hard times. We figured out a way to get people from building futures into the trades, even though there are people sitting on the bench. That's hard to do. We've made an exception. This program could get people in while we still have people on the bench. It may seem unfair, but it's not because, we're, because this program's proved itself. Those who are working out there right now all usually have their little building futures sticker on their hard hat. They recognize each other on the job and they're gaining a reputation of being good new workers. That's no bullshit, it's reality, it's happening. So when you get out there, please do the same because there's gonna be a class behind you and a class behind them. And to make this thing successful, the chain has to keep going. So I want everybody to really think about that. One of the things you also have to think about, when you join your respected craft, if you become a plumber, an electrician, a cop under a labor, a painter. Notice I always have to get that in. You know, but <laughs> you have to. But you're going to represent that union at large. And remember, this isn't just construction. It's unionized construction. You're not just going to go out there and perform your work. You're part of something bigger, something that's been around for 100 years plus, something that was created to make better conditions for people who work in the field of construction. It's really important. You gotta always think about that. You're part of a new brother and sisterhood. And you're also, you're part of your craft, you're part of the building trades, another proud organization of unionized labor. And the building trades are part of the AFL-CIO, which is organized labor in all of America. When we band together, good things happen. It's been proven again and again. We're under attack right now, if you read the papers, I hope you realize that, but we're banding together. And that means unionized postal workers, Unionize factory workers, unionize hotel workers, unionize carpenters, unionize electricians. We're banding together because we're all part of something bigger. And it's not a us and them, because the idea of unions always has been, always will be. It's a ladder. We bring, you get on that first step and you hope to bring your neighbor, your family, someone else on. And at the very least, particularly in construction, we set the conditions that the non-union guys often have to keep up to. We make it safer, they have to make it safer. We pay you a certain wage, they can't pay their guys so low, they have to keep up to us. That's another thing a union does. Maybe someone may not be in the union, but what we do benefits those who aren't in the union, who have the same field. So all of it's a big picture, and I know, it's not the first thing you're gonna think about when you go to work, but I really think you should think about it, because if you do this, and you win, and you stay in this, you'll have a career. 
You'll be 25, 30 years, you'll walk out, you'll be proud of what you did, you'll be proud of your organization, and most importantly, in America, highly unusual, you'll get a thing called a pension check. And that means you get paid for the hard work you put in when you're not working. And some people in our industry, not all, but 20, 30%, they work their 20, 25, 30 years, and when they walk away, and I'm not lying or exaggerating, they go out to that mailbox and they pick up a check for the equivalent of the dough they were just making while they worked, while they sweated, and that can happen. If you come in and you commit and you get your hours in and you make this a career, you can walk away with a paycheck for not working that you've earned for the work you put in and that you, you richly deserve. And how often, where in America are you gonna find that? You're not going to. Believe me, you're not going to. And that's never mind the fact that there's annuities, healthcare, all that other good stuff involved. So really, when you enter this, and I know they've told you that here, but I'm telling you from the reality of it, please remember this. It's a career, it's a way to survive and retire with dignity and with your health. And in America, that's hard. Because people have to work to their bones to the end of their lives, because there's no other alternatives. So re please remember that, it's a privilege that you have to earn. Now the other thing I always want to talk about when I come here is, you know, I love the construction trades, but like everywhere else, please be prepared. It's not an ideal world. And I'm not talking about the hard work, the sweat, the brain power you use. I'm talking about social skills. I always make it, a, 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 it's kind of like joining a team, some kind of sports team. Let's say a football team, because there's a lot of guys on the football team. If there's 40 guys on the football team, are 40 of those guys gonna be the nicest guys in the world? Are 40 of those guys gonna be the most intelligent guys in the world? I always say there might be a couple of psychos in there. There might be a couple of oddballs. There might be a couple of who knows what. In construction, you're gonna run into those characters. Not everyone is a stand-up guy or girl. But by and large, they are. And by and large, when you're out in the field, your actions determine everything. Believe it or not, it's not a, you'll find some racists out there. You'll find some bad people out there. But in construction, it's a great equalizer. It's how you work and what your attitude is like. You can get accepted like that because if you're a good worker and you're a good person and you're a decent person, you'll get accepted no matter where you came from, the color of your skin, female, male, all that stuff. It happens every day. There's proof out there. I couldn't lie about it. I'll bring it, you know, when you get out in the field, you see it. So remember that. You might run across a person who has a little racism or sexism. You know what? I guarantee you will. But you know, you're gonna run across them everywhere. You are, you're gonna run across them everywhere. But if you prove to the majority of people on a, on a job site all the things you've learned here that I'll say again and again, but it's so important. Show up on time. Show up on time. Show up with a clear head. Don't leave work. You know, don't do any of that. Work your eight hours. Take every hour given to you. If you do all that and you show that you can follow some orders and that you can think for yourself, you'll make it. You'll make it no matter where you were born, no matter how you look like. It happens every day. We're a democratic society. We're the great equalizer. Construction is the United Nations. It's out there. It happens. You can all do it. The proof's there. So please remember that. And remember, you may have to play it cool when you work with the proverbial asshole on the job. I've been in this business a long time. I've been on jobs where my boss was an asshole more than once. You know what? I got paid, I did my job, I may not have liked them. I kept my mouth shut unless, you know, I'm not saying you keep your mouth shut if you're insulted, if you're pushed, you know, not all that stuff. You get by it because in construction, you're going to the next one. It's a great thing. You're always going to the next one. You're not gonna be pulled in that same parking lot, parking in that same spot. We're lucky, we're unique. You'll go from Westerly to Winsocket, to Attleboro, to New Haven, and you know what? The job's two months, three months, five months, six months, and you move on. And it's, you know, it's interesting. You meet a lot of good people, it's rewarding. So if you have difficulties when you're out there with an individual, you try to make sure the other brothers and sisters around you you hang with the good guys, you hang, and they'll, they'll protect you, and you'll get past it. So please remember that. It's not that hard, but it's, you know, it's difficult. First day you walk on a job site, I don't care what you've learned in here. You are on a job site and there's 150 people with a hard hat, all hustling and bustling. I don't care who you are. It's a little overwhelming. 
I mean, you can do all this shit in this back room here, and you, you know, it's nice and light, and you got nice people around you. That's really not a construction site. Construction sites, people going up, down, all around, chaos, confusion, organized though. So you gotta be prepared for that too. That first day on a big job site, if you happen to get sent to a, a big job site the first day, your head will spin because it's an active place with a lot of things going on. But you've learned enough here, you can fit in, and you know you'll all be apprentices. We have to talk about the apprenticeship thing. Apprenticeship is exactly what it is. You gotta earn your way to be a journey person. So you will be on the bottom of the barrel and you might be asked to do menial task. You're going to be asked to do menial task. Some people will push you to do menial tasks that are unnecessary just to see if you have the wherewithal to withstand it. So you got to deal with that. Remember, the more you go in increments as an apprentice, year to year to year, three year, four year program, you'll make it. You'll be the journey person. And maybe you won't put that same apprentice through the same bullshit, but I bet you this, you'll make sure you'll test them because you don't want anyone young coming into your field who can't make it. So they have to test you, and you're going to be tested. So be prepared for that. It's not a personal insult. It's what's expected, because we're out there every day, and we need people who perform. And we work for companies, and we're a private union. Remember, we're not a public union. We work for for-profit organizations. They bid a job to make money on that job. You're going to get your pay. But they have to make money or they're not going to bid the next job. And you may not get to go to the next job if they don't have the next job. So you always have to think. You're making money. You have to make money. You have to be efficient. So it's not just about going there and grabbing your paycheck and hiding in the corner. I know you know all that. But it's essential in, co in construction that you're productive. It's essential you're part of the chain to get that building done. Because who you're working for has to leave that site with a profit. Or it always translates to this, the more work they get, the more work you might get with them. So you think about that. It's a double beneficial. They make the money, they take you along for the ride on the next one. They make money, they take you along for a ride on the next one. And when times are good, and they aren't right now, when times are good, you could be with a company sometimes for years on end. A lot of times you go projects on end. It's very tough to determine in our world which way you'll go. There's so many factors. We know some people who've been with companies for 20 years. We know people who've worked for 20 companies in two years. Because that can happen. That can happen. So you better be prepared. You're out there to make that company look good, to perform for that company, to be productive, to use your skills, to make them money. Bottom line, no way around it. You're not out there to look pretty. You're not out there to pose. You're out there to make them money, and that has to be remembered every day. You know, because that money is only gets, re gets reflected back to you. The system works well when it works. I wish everyone the best of luck. I feel very good, even though you must know you're coming into it at a hard time right now. This is the worst unemployment we've seen in the construction world since probably the Great Depression. That's not an exaggeration. We have people who've been out for six months, eight months, 10 months, 12 months, 16 months. You know, there's always layoffs in our industry, but you hope there's not lengthy layoffs. We're in a period right now, we're in the Rhode Island building trades, 17 crafts. We've averaged 40% unemployment last year. We're averaging it this year. That's out of 10,000 members. That means today there's 4,000 people sitting home hoping they get unemployment check if they're still on it, looking for another job, looking for alternative work, it will come back, it always has come back, but you're entering the industry at one of the worst downtimes it's ever been in. So there may be some weights for the people in this room, but this has happened to prior classes too. Some people are lucky enough to get right out and get involved. Some people are gonna sit around, it may take three months, four months, five months, but stick with this program and you'll get there. We've been successful so far. I can't tell you any other thing because it's true. We've been successful at placing most of the graduates of the last few classes. It's taken some time, we'll be successful again. So all of you, stick with it. Don't get discouraged because probably you're not gonna walk out the door and walk into one of our halls tomorrow. I wish you were. Some of you will probably be taken into apprentice programs, which is a great step, but you'll have to be prepared. You might sit in that room, in the classroom, at night or Saturdays, whatever it is, for six or seven months before you see the light of a job site right now because the industry is down. So I want you to be prepared for that. I want to make it brief, short. I just want to tell you it's a great program. 
You should all be proud of it. I tout it all the time, and I'm not in the position to tout things that aren't truthful because I represent the building trades. I represent my organization, and I wouldn't be out there telling an owner or a subcontractor that building futures candidates are good. But that's what I do all the time because I firmly believe it. Had great luck. I've seen great luck. The program is doing great, but we're still in its infancy. We're going to rely on your actions, and it's all about your actions. Please trust me. Doesn't mean you have to be the nicest person. Doesn't mean you have to be a kiss ass. It means you're going to get to the job, do what's told, do it efficiently, work hard, work every hour, show up on time. All very simple. All very simple. None of it, none of it some kind of voodoo science. If you can do that, and that's what you've told everyone, that's why you've made it so far. And most of the time, we do pretty good. Three quarters, four fifths of the class makes it. I hope you're part of three quarters, four fifths, but it's on you. It's on you. It's on you to try, it's on you to, on you to prove yourself, and that's just the industry. You're gonna to have to prove yourself. And I think you can. I wish you the best of luck, and I hope, it's always happens, my favorite part, sometimes six months from now, eight months from now, I'll be on a job site, you'll come up to me in a hot hat, I won't quite recognize you, but I'll see that little Building Futures sticker, and you'll say, hey, you came and talked to us. And I'll say, all right, who are you working for? I'm with the plumbers. I'm with the, I'm with the elevator operators. I'll say, fantastic, I'm glad to see you made it, and it will happen, and please come up and see me, and we'll reminisce, and I'll say, thumbs up, man, first step, you're in. Second step, make a career out of it. Because you can, and it's a good career, it's, it, you know, it takes a toll on your body, takes a toll on your brain, but it's a good career. And as I said, where else in America are you going to be able to retire at a decent age and get a pension check and maybe have some money in the bank with your annuity? You're not going to find an opportunity like this. It's a unique opportunity. That's what unions provide. That's what the building trades provides. That's what we're here for. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us for this evening's edition of Labor Vision. We appreciate your input and encourage your comments. Labor Vision can be seen three times each week here on Channel 14. Join us on Tuesdays at 7 p.m., Thursdays at 8 p.m., and Saturdays at 5 p.m.